Jeff Carter with Seattle City Club, and today, as part of our civic boot camp on housing instability, I'm going to be talking with Daniel Zavala with We Are In and Building Changes, um, and we'll be talking about the homelessness crisis and housing crisis in our region and what We Are In and Building Changes is doing to address those. So welcome, Daniel, and thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. So let's just start. What is what is we are in, and you can address building changes as well. Sure. So yeah. So I, uh, building changes is a statewide nonprofit organization that works um, primarily around youth and family homelessness, and looking at the intersections of housing, education, health, and importantly, um, addressing the disproportionality and disparities around race and ethnicity that often persist within. Um, populations that are experiencing homelessness. One of the projects that we are launching this year um, is kind of what we're calling the partners group, which was meant to be a broad collaborative of um, philanthropy, business, government representation, and importantly, and what's often missed when we think about kind of collaboratives or tables is providers and people with lived experience that are having kind of decision-making and authority um, within this table and this collaborative as well. The communications and campaign function of this is what we are calling We Are In, which is meant to do broad outreach to the public um, to not only just create awareness around the issue of homelessness um, and what the government and the regional authority that will be you know, set up um, will be doing around homelessness, but also to to share what we're learning um, and to share innovation, to share data, um, to share opportunities to engage where that's appropriate. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, while I lead building changes, the project of the partners group and the communications function of we are in are really going to be the external facing um, components of this work. So what is the, the ultimate goal of we are in, and I guess building changes? Yeah, so I think for so long, our approach to homelessness in this region has really been around kind of just managing, right? And I think when we think about the types of resources um, that have been available to date, that's really all we've been able to do. And with a massive inflow increasing, and as we think about even just what we're experiencing right now with COVID and our economic climate and an eviction moratorium that will likely lift, that pressure on the system will only continue. And so, we are in, you know, the end goal is to, you know, and the partners group is really, and the regional authority, I should say, is really to recognize that just managing the crisis won't actually get us to an end state where we're seeing population level reduction. And so what we really want to think about is how do we, yes, better services, ensure that there is better access, ensure that we are addressing issues um, that have resulted in racial disproportionalities, but also think about at a systemic level, what do we need to do in order to help stem some of that inflow so that folks aren't um, kind of falling into episodes of homelessness. And one of the things that we absolutely know is critical is building more affordable housing, ensuring that there are more, um, not just you know affordable housing, um, uh, but, you know, lower rents, lower vacancy rates, all of the like that we know will contribute to a healthier environment where people can maintain their stable housing as well. Mm -hmm. So backing up just a little bit, what is the regional homelessness authority and how, do you, how would you interact with that? Because I think there's a lot of these things that get, um, you know, uh, promoted and then we're, it gets, gets confusing as to what, what yeah. is what. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. So certainly there are a lot of moving parts, right? And I think the Regional Homelessness Authority is intended to consolidate what was happening disparately at, uh, disconnected and disparately at the county level, at the city of Seattle level, as well as other cities around our county. And so the idea behind the Regional Authority is to consolidate the efforts and to align the efforts. Um, I should say it's to align the efforts across the board and to consolidate where appropriate, right? So in some instances, it's consolidating resources, consolidating um, some of the staffing and the government functions. And then other instances, right, we do wanna maintain some levels of autonomy because this is a regional approach that requires a local kind of flavor to each of the different areas within the county. And so 
that is really the government function. And when we think about our responses to homelessness and the way that we can address um, the overall needs around housing um, security within the region, that's, that's what that function is going to do. That's where the, the most of the money is going to be. That's where policies are going to be made. And that regional authority will interact with the local city and county councils, as well as the state government as appropriate. What I've discussed around We Are In and the partners group is really to kind of consolidate and collaborate amongst all of the non-governmental entities with alignment and engagement from government. But when we think about interested parties, whether it's the general public, philanthropy, business sector, service providers that are predominantly private, nonprofit and independent service providers, as well as people who are presently or have previously experienced homelessness, that's the that's kind of the I guess the the community groups you know that are non governmental that will be a part of this and so the two are really kind of created to be in partnership with each other. And so who who else is involved? You mentioned you know the a group that's involved with We Are In. Can you just name a few of the the key players uh, that that's involved in this? Sure. So I'll start with the Lived Experience Coalition, which was um, kind of an organically created group of um, individuals and households um, that are presently or have previously experienced homelessness to really kind of flip the power dynamic, right? Um, to recognize that so often previously decisions have been made from this top-down approach where government on behalf of or to communities and really the idea from here is really to be driven from the notion of what would it look like to do with, right? To be in service to. And so the Lived Experience Coalition is kind of, I think the, the primary driver that, that we find ourselves accountable to. And um, other partners include kind of philanthropic partners. So uh, the Rakes Foundation, the Gates Foundation, the Balmer Group, Campion um, Foundation, Symmetra, Microsoft, um, folk and I'm just gonna, I think the, the list can keep continuing sure. on but you know again a number of a business as well as philanthropy have been kind of through these initial planning stages for the last kind of year and a half and you know as we are just now getting kind of formalized and ready to launch it really is ready to expand even further how do we bring in other individuals um, who are interested in this issue area um, to come into the conversation. So in, in what I've read is that quite often, like the regional homeless authority, they say they've got grand plans, but then it's hard to coordinate because there's no, no one who has a specific like authority to actually implement something, you know, region wide. And I'm wondering how we are in can help kind of push that, push that along or, or is that your, is that your intent or is it to, yeah. So certainly it would be part of it. And I should note that one of the, the ways that we want to function is not that it's just building changes saying, here's what our agenda is for the next three years. And we're going to move forward with that, right? We want to be responsive to the broad set of stakeholders and collaborators that are coming in. And so, um, you know, what the work looks like will absolutely shift as the environment shifts or as, you know, the community kind of dictates what we should be doing. To your specific question though, um, yes, part of what we're trying to do is support the work of the regional authority. And one thing about our region, we love process, but at the same time, we also don't have a lot of patience. And so, great, we'll go through a huge process. And then ultimately, like when something's in place, we need it to work immediately. And if it doesn't work immediately, we're ready for ousting, you know, those who are staffed within it. Um, and like this issue, right, the, the focusing on homelessness, we know like the long term goal, right, of 15,000 affordable ho housing, like that is going to take time, that's going to take a lot of money. And so we need to be patient on that. At the same time, right, and I think this is the duality of what this regional authority will have to focus on is keep our North Star in front of us. But what are some of those short-term things that we can do immediately that are going to have profound impact? And so, um, you know, again, so to your question, we will absolutely be supporting, you know, the regional authority to have, you know, the ability to do these things long-term and at the same time also pushing, right, with friendly partnership, but pushing um, to focus on some of the more urgent needs for some short-term uh, success and accomplishment as well. So to that, 
to that point, what, it, what are your short-term kind of initiatives? I know you're just starting out, so maybe you still have to define those, but I guess what are your short-term initiatives and how do you actually set those priorities? How do you know what to do when? Um, yeah, so, I mean, we're really kind of quite literally just starting, even <laughs> this, this month is just starting, you know, some of these initial meetings. And so we haven't set what year one looks like yet. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I can give you my thoughts of what those might be and what I'll be bringing to those conversations. But ultimately, we want this to be driven, as I said, right, by people with lived experience, by folks from community, um, so that it's not just driven from, from one perspective. And so, you know, I, I don't know what we'll be focusing on. You know, we know we'll be focusing on homelessness. We know we'll be focusing on kind of urgent needs and what we're hearing from community. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you think we are in differs from past collaborative efforts um, that seem to have kind of blossomed and then faded? And, mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering if, if, how this differs or how is this unique? Yeah, so I think one, and this is where I was kind of talking about the the unique as well as the significant, um, the significant nature of the lived experience coalition is just actually having people with lived experience at the table and making the decisions. Having influence and authority to help make those decisions is critical. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know when we when we look at the way that we've done things in the past when I've seen those tables, they're not often reflective of the populations that are experiencing homelessness, that they haven't been really intentional about focusing on racism and racial disproportionalities, that they you know, haven't really engaged the broader public in a wide scale conversation. And so part of that we are in campaign is again, to get broad public engagement in the issue of homelessness because one of the things that I think we've done previously is had government working, right? Um, and, you know, and, and so I'll, I'll pause, I guess I'll put like a quick <laughs> note here of just have government working, but not necessarily bringing the public and being transparent along the way so that people are brought in and understand, ah, things are getting better, right? But there's a larger population. So that's where I was gonna go with this is that, you know, when we look at the work that's been done in this county and in this region, over the previous years, it's not that things haven't worked. We're actually doing better now than we were five years ago, right? It's just that the population size has increased. Our climate has changed such that there is higher need. And so, um, so that's, again, you know, part of, part of this is, is to be transparent about that so that when the public might see after the eviction moratorium lifts an uptick, in folks that are experiencing homelessness, there's an understanding of what that means. And importantly, there's an understanding of what's being done to address it. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the, the, the systemic racism issues. I'm wondering how, how this coalition would actually address some of the underlying systemic racism issues in our, our system, housing, homelessness, et cetera, and how, how this coalition would actually work to address that. Yeah, so part of the way, um, so we are in, again, the kind of public facing communications campaign, but the partners group itself, one of the functions is to actually have kind of innovation and practice around that systems change. And so, you know, through kind of small, you know, and I say small as compared to what the larger regional authority will have, philanthropic and corporate and other kind of, um, you know, dollars that are provided, we can actually kind of catalyze some of this systems change. And so we can really hone in and focus on piloting and prototyping different ideas that um, will change the way that we've approached this work to date. And so particularly around um, anti-racism and focusing on racial equity, like that is part and parcel of what we're focused on. And as we develop what our specific kind of grants might be in year one, um, that's gonna be front and center at the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so for those people who are kind of disillusioned by the whole process and disillusioned by what they see on the street, what would you say to kind of give them kind of a sense of hope that change is possible and that you, you've already mentioned that there has been success, but how can you kind of give people a sense that things are moving in a positive direction? Yeah, um, it's a good question. And I'm sitting here trying to come up with what's my, <laughs> what's my motivational speech, but I think, 
you know, this issue is delicate and it's complex, right? I think the solution is simple, right? Build more houses um, and get folks, you know, into stable housing with supportive services that ensure that folks can stay stably housed. The challenge with that, right, is we have geographic limitations, right? We only have so much land that's available and it's expensive. Um, we have regulations around what housing looks like and how we do permitting and the time and length to do that. Um, to date, we've had such a strong economic climate that there hasn't really been strong incentive to create affordable housing, right? Mm -hmm. It's often just gone to the highest market rate. And so, you know, when I, you know, to, to what I guess you're asking, it's, it's the notion of asking for patience that, you know, it's patience with I think the pushing of urgency, right? Be patient because it takes time to build 15,000 affordable housing units. At the same time, make sure that we're holding government and other actors accountable to doing something urgently, right? So that we're thinking about, great, okay, so if it's about permitting and regulations, what are we doing to fast track folks that want to create affordable housing. If it's about creating, you know, and buying more land, what's the plan to do that, right? Because if somebody tomorrow said, great, I'm ready to build 15,000 units, where are those going to go, right? And one of the things that we know is that as the um, sound transit stations come on board and the desire to create density around those stations, that's a huge opportunity to actually create a lot of units um, with land that is already available. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of this is recognizing that this is all going to cost money, even though government presently has several hundred millions of dollars that they're putting towards this issue, we're talking about a need that's on the magnitude of billions, right, wow. over the course of a decade or more. And so, again, as we think about, you know, what can, you know, how, what's the, what's the bright light at the end of the tunnel, it's recognizing that where can we allocate money and are we willing to actually, you know, put uh, money toward an issue that we want to see resolution to. Because if we just keep with the existing resources that we have, it'll go back to what I said at the outset, which is we will be focusing on managing the crisis and the crisis response and not really thinking about resolution and solutions that will actually ensure that folks that are experiencing homelessness can actually have stable and permanent housing. Do you have any examples of like success stories that we can build on in this region? like tiny home projects or, or first, you know, housing first initiatives, just. Two, two examples of what you've just given, like <clears throat> there are a number of different things we're doing. And I, I guess the other part of what we should say is that no population is a monolith, right? And so when we think about homelessness, you know, there are a number of different kind of demographics and circumstances within the population of people and families that are experiencing homelessness. And so, what might work for one might not necessarily be appropriate for another. Um, so we have, I guess, a lot of tools in our tool belt and it's really about, again, are those things getting us toward families and people being permanently and stably housed with access to services? Or is it really about, do you have temporary relief, right? Is this really about crisis management and it's not actually about a long-term solution? And so, when we think about what has worked, you know, permanent supportive housing has worked really well. Um, you know, when we think about rapid rehousing as another example that has worked well, diversion as an approach has worked really well, but all those three things have worked really well for different populations. Sure. And so again, it goes to kind of, there's a lot that's working within the region and it's about scaling up what is working so that we can manage the crisis. And then again, ultimately that North star of, making sure that there are enough affordable housing units for people to actually move into so that they can be permanently housed. So a lot of people ask me when we do these workshops, it's like, so what can I do? I'm kind of overwhelmed. I see people camped in my park nearby and I don't know what to do, you know? And, and so how can they get involved in like we are in or building changes or what, what other suggestions do you have for people? Yeah, so a couple of things. So one, I might actually kind of, I think, push back a little bit on the characterization of what you just said, which is camped in my park, right? This notion of my, sure. when we think about folks that are experiencing homelessness, the vast majority, and we're talking, you know, 80 plus percent of people that are experiencing homelessness are from the county 
um, that they are presently residing, right? So their previous place of residence was within that same county. And so we're talking about our neighbors, right? It's not this notion of this is my park and I get to use it and you're coming in. And it's it, no, like, I think when we create that, we're like starting to create this desensitization and this notion of like, you are a nuisance and I need you out of my park, right? It's mm -hmm. actually the support is like, this is all of our land. These are all of our services. How can we actually help our neighbors? And so I think step one of what can people do is creating this mindset and this notion of these are our neighbors, this is our community and what can we all collectively do to make this a better place to live? Because I think one thing that any person that sees or knows of somebody that's experiencing homelessness is recognizing that that is not a humane or healthy way to live. And so step one, right? Change the mindset and create a sense of empathy within our community that this is our community and our collective problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other, and I think is, is to, yes, to, to get involved and to reach out to service providers who are often understaffed or have great needs. It's to engage in the conversation. So as we are in, you know, the communications campaign is seeking folks to participate in this conversation, join that conversation. And then importantly, and this goes to the part around the regional authority, it's twofold, right? One, have patience for our elected officials and the folks as this plan has been created to have time to come to fruition and to create success and results. But the other part of that, right, is to be ever present and ensure that there is this constant press on urgency and accountability for our public and frankly, all folks that are in this sector to actually keep maintaining focus on the issue. So how would people get more uh, information about Building Changes? What's your website? Uh, so just buildingchanges.org. And then you're welcome to follow also on social media channels, either at Building Changes and also with We Are In at We Are In. We Are In. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. And um, I also want to thank our sponsor, Alaska Airlines, for helping us put these on. Mm -hmm.